Do you remember your first neck reset? Mine was a guild. Ugh. Wide heel. Oh, uh, do I remember my first neck reset? I'm not fully sure, but uh, in those days, you have to understand that we were doing things differently. Yeah. Uh, the logic, the logic was fairly for a number of steps one is we start with start with the understanding that martin's dovetail joint is too difficult to take apart so we don't do that okay then well how do you make, how do you reset the neck uh well there were guys who put a wedge-shaped shim under the whole length of the fingerboard yeah uh, which uh, we still see done on classicals like ramirez guitar um, but our pal John Lundberg in Berkeley was resetting necks on on, on Martin's really before we started in business. And he used a, a method that he brought with him from Chicago when he had it. And when he worked, worked and lived there, uh, it's unfortunately gotten the, the moniker of the California neck reset. California neck reset. It's only because Lundberg was so important in this area. But uh, the logic was, if the neck is too difficult to get out, and if once it's out, you have trouble reestablishing the angle perfectly, why don't we loosen the back and the neck block and then collapse it back in on itself? And we can test the playability right then with strings and everything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't bend the fingerboard at the body. Uh, it's basically what what we were saying at, at the time we were saying, you know, what we're responding to is a change in the shape of the body. We all knew that. So we're trying to change the shape of the body back the other way in, mm -hmm. some, in some form. And so to do that, you end up with uh, a 16th of an inch of, of the back kind of hanging over at the neck end of things. And so that means that re means removing binding and refitting it and gluing it all up and that kind of thing. Were, Maybe finish up some touch up on the binding. Were people uh, was anybody doing that technique well where they were like kind of re regrooming the rabbit to to make the binding stay the correct size or or was I was it? just about to get there. Oh okay. I'm sorry. Uh, and our pal, our pal John was done to do it on 45s. Uh -huh. You can't do it on a, a D40, but a, a style 45 Martin without pulling all that crap out, rechanneling it, put it back in piece by piece, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, yes, we were. We were uh, recutting it so that it would all fit back where it's supposed to go. Uh, and it was. 1975, maybe, when mm. <clears throat> we had a, a, a well-known local guitar came to visit us. Uh, it belonged to a guy by the name of Barry Olivier. And he's, he's the guy who started folk festivals in this area. And it was the first one to do a, an actual folk festival in the, in the country, I think, the Berkeley Folk Festival. And he, he must have started that in about 60 or 61. Um, and he owned this 20s vintage Martin Triple O 45 that was stolen from him. And at one point, story, these stories are going to go on forever. You guys are going to get so bored. I'm, uh, I'm in it to win it, Frank. You keep uh, going. One of those, uh, he, his guitar was stolen. Uh, and uh, not spotted at all until uh, a person brought it into John Lemberg's shop to see about getting it kind of cleaned up and, and set up in new strings and stuff. And John says, I know this guitar. Where did you get it? 
And he says, oh, I live in this, this kind of mobile home park, you know, and we've been using it as a uh, like a $25 chip in, in, our, in our nightly card games. So, he, you know, we just, we just been passing it around uh, in the range of 25 bucks worth. Uh, I don't know how, how everything went down from there. It, it was a, it rather quickly returned to Barry, who was delighted to get it back. And it needed to have its neck reset. Uh, I think John had, had gained a, a bit more wisdom in those days and said, sorry, but I don't want to do it. You know, give it to these guys to do. And so he sent Barry to us. And I took one look at it and said, I don't want to do this. Uh -huh. I'm not. I'm not taking all that pearl out. I'm not taking all that, all that precious little, you know, brittle wood binding, uh, 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 purfling out of there. I just ain't doing it. And so that's that was the genesis of steaming the neck out for us. Had you did you come up with that on your own, or did you had you heard somebody doing it somewhere uh, or something? I think I can name three or four guys who invented it on their own. So it was a, simul a simultaneous, simultaneous uh, it genesis. It all about the same time when the necessity or the item makes itself, uh, makes itself, presents itself. Had you been thinking about it up to that point? It's kind of a... No. It just occurred Not to you. Until, all, I was, until I had to do it. Until you were faced with the prospect of peeling the binding off of the 45 and you're like, was, there's got to be had, a better way. Had to come up with something. And so we, you know, the question then was, we knew that that to get the neck out was really messy. So the, the conventional wisdom at the time was to remove the section of the fingerboard over the body. Which you don't want to do on a 45. And then that exposes, the, that exposes the dovetail joint. You pour water in it, and then you, then you heat up like, you know, framing nails, red hot, and put them in there. And that boils the water in the joint. And that's what guys are doing, you know. The original heat stick. And, uh, you know, there's there's any number of stories about the way things used to be done or or some farmer did them a couple of times and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we, we still see that, the results of those kicking around. But I, I was not about to take a, a, a 20 vintage part 45 and, and get into that deep for... For if there was any other way out, and so that was pretty much the first time and I used a, a pressure cooker and a hot plate. And the pressure cooker and hot plate were the mainstays of Nickery setting pretty much right along until somebody somebody showed me, oh, hey, you can just convert one of these these little uh, espresso makers, use the milk steamer part. Oh, cool, man. And then I guess it was, I don't know, a dozen or 15 years ago, I finally decided that, you know, I ought to look and see what else is out there in the way of steam generators, because if there's something better than we have, we should have it, you should get it. You know? And so I started looking online for steam things, and uh, I learned something right away. That, uh, that first off, there are such things as high quality steam generators. Uh, jewelers use them for steam cleaning rings. And uh, what surprised me is that, that the, the conventional way to deal with fabrics is use a steam iron. And what I learned was, I didn't even know what a steam iron was. Steam iron is, a, is an iron that runs 100% on steam, it has a hose that comes to it, and so its only heat source is the steam. So I ended up getting one of those out of Canada. It's a, it's a next, it's, it became our next steamer. And it's a, it's a boiler with an on off switch and a foot pedal to actuate a valve that lets the steam out. Uh, it has, uh, has pressure control and a gauge on it. And it, and it runs normally at a pressure of about 50 PSI. Uh, it works so much better than all these other things because 
that if you look up the, you know steam pressure and temperature guess what the temperature is a lot higher at 50 to 50 pounds a square inch it's up around 250 and that means the stuff in the joint gets hot glue liquefies and everything before before uh, it builds up so much moisture that it oozes all around outside and makes a real mess. Yes, it still does that, but there's we found ways to avoid that as well. Yeah, you have that. Uh, you have a station for popping nets, correct? Well, it's it's a movable rig that we throw onto the bench. We have no way that we have shop space for anything like that. Yeah, to have its own place, but it hangs it hangs on the wall, so the steamer's on a shelf and the the rig is on a wall, and you know, clamp it up. You know, speaking of neck resets years ago, and maybe this is on frets.net too, but you had made a aluminum uh, fixture for holding the neck, for applying the chisel flat, you know, adjusting the neck angle and then oh, applying yeah. the chisel flat to that. Is that, do you still use that or is that? No, it was a total bit of over design. It was no, beautiful. It didn't. I think it, didn't do... it, I, I, it was. It does a really perfect job, but it does the same job in a lot more time with a lot more effort uh, than using the sandpaper yeah. to pull through the joint. I and just, so, well, yeah, if there's a way to make it slicker, I'll try it. So, I, I just always you know, wondered got, if, I've like, a, I've got a garage full of dead ends. Uh huh. I, I got a brain full of them, too. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. Yeah. But that, that one always piqued my curiosity because some of them, it seems like I get neck, neck uh, resets from time to time that I, I feel like maybe I'm pulling too much sandpaper. I could get a, I could get a little rowdy with a chisel first, but you know, if you're, if you're not into it, if you made it and you're not into it, then I'm going to take the word for it. So. No, I, I even made a special chisel for it. And, uh, I, I bent a regular chisel and gave it a really sharp cutting angle and, and all this kind of stuff, and it, it takes a razor thin bit off, but adjusting it to get that razor shim, thin shim that where you want it to turns out to be just simply more work than it's worth. Thank and you. The, and the result isn't any better. Are you, this sandpaper is so slick. When I saw the, the trade secrets that you uh, had sent Dan off to get from Jeff Dragett's shop, I can't even imagine where my... Uh, Career would have been without that little that old tip. Um, that probably would have given up trying to figure out how to do a chisel neck reset freehand all the time. Um, well, you know, you talk to the Martin guys that do that. I did talk to one just a few years ago, really, who was a young guy working in, the, in that area, and his job was doing the final neck angle adjustment, mm -hmm. the final fitting of the neck. And I said, "No, oh, do you do you guys use sandpaper?" He says, "No." I'll chisel. Yeah. Everything was a chisel. And I said, oh, well, how many, how many, how many do you have to do? He says, oh, my quota is 36 a day. I would imagine you'd get pretty. And I just <laughs> said, yep. Just, it just reminds you. The guys get really good at what they do. They get real good. They get real fast too. Really and they good. get real, they get real focused. The, uh, are you a, uh, are you uh every neck reset gets a refret kind of guy or do you, uh, if do you, possible. Yeah. They're, the results are better that way. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and we like to think of some jobs that we do as being, uh, how do I say, dis describable as a stock kind of price. In other words, somebody says, how much to have the Nick reset on your guitar? My guitar, mm -hmm. I say, well, what I want to say is shop hours times per hour. And you never know what it's going to be. Uh, and there aren't people really all that interested in signing blank check. Even though, even though in the balance, they may, they may get it cheaper. But yeah. it's, it's a risk, you know. And so you just uh, that just isn't the way we tend to do things. And, and uh, so if you hire a contractor to remodel the kitchen, you just say, well, call me, let me know it's what, when it's done, and I'll write you a check. For whatever it costs, mm -hmm. and then people say, "No, no, no! What do you, what do you, what are you going to charge me?" And so, with uh, neck resetting, uh, we like to 
say, okay, neck resetting, start off by defining the problem. We gotta change, we gotta change the neck angle. Uh, we have to make everything playable when we're finished. Uh, and frets are a little uneven and stuff like that. And we, you know, we could we could save a little by let's say not doing much of the frets over the body or at the joint of the body. But I got to tell you, the number of times we've we've completed that job for people and find them come back and say, "Well, oh, gee, it's got this little buzz when I get the action really low," you know, or something like that. We just say, you know. It's better to say the way we define neck resetting includes all these things, including refretting and nut and saddle work, whatever it takes to get it back to what we would consider new guitar playability. And we don't publicize necessarily that if a person comes in and, and we can pull the neck and put it back in without, without refretting it, we might actually give them a call and say, you know, this one, uh, Probably doesn't need that refretting. It might be saving you a few bucks. But the reality is we find that it's, it's so little savings in time yeah. over the over the chasing your tail of, of nailing down all the possible uneven frets and things like that. It also so seems like if, if you go in with like they spent six hundred dollars on a neck reset and it isn't meeting expectations afterwards, even if you front load the conversation with, if I don't get to refret this, then it doesn't get to be perfect. You still wind up having these conversations with people about why it isn't perfect at the end of it. Yeah. Right. So the, the point is that, uh, how do I start over? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hijack. For me you. anyway, uh, it's, it's uh, I'm starting to lose my train of thought here. The uh, the whole kind of cost breakdown and everything is is a little hard to figure out, you know, with that stuff with with the with the little possibles that can that can crop up, you know. Right. What if you have a finish problem? So on. Can I ask you? Uh, so, when when you're in for it and you and you're going to do a neck reset and a refret, do you uh, do you set the deck to the old frets? Do you pull the old frets out after it's off? Do you pull the frets out before you take the neck off and chew up the board a little bit before you pull? Oh them no, out? I would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do anything but to. I would do the neck reset completely. Uh, that is to say, all of the all of the physical stuff of, the, of getting the neck in there until it's, and have it all glued up solid. Uh, and at that point, then. Take the frets out and refret it. In other words, just like a regular refret job without resetting the neck. Okay. And uh, do you? Um, oh no, I lost my chance. Uh, I, had a, I had a really good follow up. Well, we'll have a hit on here in a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, do, oh, do you have a? Do you have like any kind of saddle height that you're shooting for? One of the things I noticed, like. One of my real problem things with with neck sets is like Gibson's with flat flat bridges and twelve inch radius fingerboards. And where do you yeah, yeah, yeah. where do you set the neck to? Do you have a good rule of thumb on that? No, I have a, no, I have a bad one. Yeah, you have a bad rule of yeah. thumb. Yeah. You have a bad rule of all thumbs. <laughs> bad rule of thumbs. Well, it's again, it's it's one of those things that we try to take. Both a common sense and playability uh, perspective, along with the historical. And some instruments started out life with rather rather low satellites, and maybe they should always be that way. Yeah. So we find ourselves less interested in jacking up the saddle to the highest possible current th standards, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and so we we try to achieve the best the best neck angle we can with the least messing around with the bridge as possible. Except in as much as if we're replacing the bridge, that's completely messing around with it. But we'll try to make a bridge that would be appropriate for that instrument uh, because we see we see a lot of neck resetting done in the 
in the with the intent of good playability, but in doing so, they'll define it by modern specs and end up with a, a one inch bridge with a very tall saddle that structurally unstable. Yeah. Uh, particularly if you use steel strings, you know. Yeah, I think thankfully the era of tall, super tall saddles is maybe drawn to a close. I think people are starting to get pretty wise that it's putting a lot of force on it. Also, it seems like maybe your geometry doesn't stay stable over the time, over time, oh, yeah, that much that's leverage. Right. And everything's moving all the time. And so that's a, that's a tricky bit of business. Mm -hmm.